And hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Bamsus Podcast. It is episode 168, it's July 10th. And as always, my name is Raisin, but hey, you can call me G. And sat right next to me across the pond is Drag. Hello, hello. Well, it's been a while, hasn't it? Sorry we weren't on last week. It's July, so we always take it slow. And I guess this time we're doing the same because it's a fireside chat, similar to one we had recently. It's literally just me and Drac talking about recent gaming things. Yeah, this time of year is always slow. uh, Well, I I should say slow for interviews because the uh, devs are busy getting things, you know, put put together for conferences and stuff like that. So sit back, relax, and enjoy listening to us just go on about things. That is correct. Slow time for us because it's convention season. But it also means there's actually a lot of big news and interesting news and things going on, like the recently um, thing in London, Tenocon. Digital Extremes showing up every year, last four years now, for a day and talking about Warframe, everything Warframe, and where they reveal their big things, their big news, their big whatever thing they're doing to the game. And um, last year, we saw Railjack, Project Railjack, under development, I think this time they've actually shown us what they're going to do, and it looks awesome. <laughs> well, that and I, I saw some kind of a CGI trailer, which... Uh, is this supposed to just introduce the new content, to, or is this, in, you know, like an introduction, the, the trailer itself, an introduction for folks who haven't played Warframe? No idea which trailer you saw. I saw the one for um, Empyrean, which is... A nice little trailer where somebody gets knocked out and he's now in some kind of fugue dream state on a planet and squaring off with a character on a horse that is mechanical. So a horse that's not a horse. Oh, I didn't even see that one. No, the one I saw was some lady putting, looked like lotus flowers in front of uh, three different Tenno and then it was like giving flashbacks to when they were in action. Okay, I think I might actually miss that one. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was an article, something about, uh, you know, the Warframe devs were finally getting into doing uh, CGI trailers, and it was pretty badass. And it was a neat-looking trailer. Um, I just, I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be something that was introing the game to someone who had never played, because I haven't really played Warframe since it was first released on Steam years ago. Um, so, yeah, I just haven't gotten back into it. Well, there is a thing that Warframe in the last few years have really gotten deep into the story building. The world building, they, they're they telling excellent stories in the game. But there isn't much in the way of, yeah, trailers, cinematics. Uh, not the way we know them, for example, from CCP. So they are getting into that now. It's nice to see. So what's the difference with uh, with Railjack then? I guess, uh, you know, the quick clip I said, or I saw the of them getting ready to present it, talked about in the past, they had brought, you know, big DLC drops, but uh, which were like new areas that you would go to. Uh, and kind of ignore all the other content while you played through the new area, and then then you would go back to the regular content or whatever, whereas this was supposed to somehow connect things. So how does this pull everything together? Oh, that's the fun part, because there's so many things in what they showed, and you can't go, well, it's just this. Um, Project Railjack, when they presented last year, was the idea that you can get these much larger ships that can do combat, and where you can engage in ship-to-ship combat, you can board other other ships, the enemy ships, and they're building on that in a way where, yeah, you can still, you can fly as a group, you can get your friends on your ship, ship that you deck out, slightly different from all the other things in Warframe, so not cards, but you can still design it, what do you want, what kind of weaponry, what kind of defenses, and your friends can come with, they can take some of their turrets and shoot, or they can literally be shot out from the railjack at enemy ships and board them. So there's the first level of playing together. But the next one is then, well, your party is in space, fighting a giant enemy of some sort that is being protected by a base on the ground, extending a shield. Can anybody say Battle of Endor? (laughs) And suddenly another team gets the message on the ground, here's a mission to do, please do this mission. Now, it's curious because this works if you know who's on the ground, but relying on randoms being on the planes of Eidolon, picking up those missions, ooh, 
and then relying on them succeeding, that's a, that's a big if. So it's not your quote-unquote away team that goes to take care of that? Only if you have another team who knows they're supposed to do this. So if you have, let's say, four people up in space doing their thing, and you know from your clan there's somebody on the planes who can pick up that mission when it shows up, then sure. Otherwise, it shows up as random for anybody who has a little beacon ready and go do that. Now, you mentioned this is cooperative. Are they adding any PvP elements to this, or is it strictly a a cooperative-type play uh, style right now? I think it's fair to say pretty much everything in... Almost everything, let's be honest. In Warframe is cooperative. There is PvP, but the most PvP that there is in Warframe is who looks coolest, right? Because it's fashion frame. It's who has the most colors and the most bling. But there, there is some PvP, but it's kept very different, and it's not in Railjack, it's not on the planes. And I don't, I don't think there's a lot of people who really play Warframe for PvP. I would not know. You need to get into that game. It's gorgeous and it's glorious. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's another one of those that I just I have on my list to get back to, and I just haven't done it yet. But this is one of those things I've looked for in gaming for ages. I want to see more of this. I want to see that my squad is assigned a task, and it might be not fully dependent, but partially dependent on another squad completing their task. We saw this in Resistance 2. In the multiplayer, there was literally a structure where uh, it was three squads against three squads given different missions on the same map. Now, everybody just went, oh shit, there's an enemy. Let's chase the enemy instead of doing their missions. It, It failed miserably. But the idea was there that you had your mission, another squad had their mission, go do them. Here, it, yeah, it can't fail in the same way because it isn't PvP. But I want to see more of this in games in general. Mac had something similar. Come on, show us games where squad based missions, squad based objectives actually matter and affect each other. I know people hate that they're failing because it's another squad failing, but I want to see this. I want to see some dependencies. Vermintide did something like that where you had different objective pointers to get to and one of the things that I noticed playing that game was the faster you get through the objectives the more likely you are to survive to the end of the game and the longer that you stay in one place the more waves would spawn and then it would spawn you know some of the special type uh, creatures that would come at you. Um, but yeah, depending on who you're playing with, if, uh, if you're playing with somebody who's like absolutely got to kill every zombie before they move on it really slows you down. It's it's not really the objective of the game to kill everything. It's The objective is to get to the points. Um, the, the checkpoints, I should say. So, yeah, people people get really caught up on the enemies they see on the screen and taking out the enemies and sometimes forget that that's not the objective. And that was the headache, as I said, in Resistance 2. It devolved into a team deathmatch. People did not understand. Yeah, there's an enemy over there in the distance. Leave him alone. It's another player. But he's not your concern. They couldn't. <laughs> Which I guess is why, again, um, Battle Royale, Team Deathmatch, these games are uh, super, super popular. That's what people want to play. That's the easiest one to understand. Just shoot the ones with a red triangle above their head. I don't know. It's, it's kind of funny because this seems to almost go uh, almost opposite to this article I was reading on uh, Swiss Info, this website, SwissInfo.ch. Where they talk about, uh, you know, playing computer games is supposed to improve uh, concentration and um, attention span and stuff like that. But it sounds like folks are just going, ooh, squirrel, and running after it. <laughs> oh, no, I believe that that um, different types of game can improve different elements. Um, I saw an article of talking about it. Sorry, I don't have the link for it. It was a while back. That uh, surgeons being trained today can do things surgeons 20 years couldn't do simply because they grew up playing video games and they have better motor skills, fine motor skills. Um, But I can totally see that players will have better attention in chasing that red triangle, you know, but not in actually doing the missions, perhaps. So it would be interesting to see just what kind of attention, what can they focus on versus what can they not, and where are they, might they be lacking, i.e. is it purely positive effect? Yeah, with something like this, um, 
this was a really short article, but it was just, it's one of those things where it's like, you really got to see a lot more data to this because uh, I've always had a problem with my own attention span. But when it comes to something that I'm really interested in, I can hyper focus on that. And I, I, but it doesn't apply to everything else in life. So, you know, I, they were saying that, you know, people playing video games could, uh, you know, detect and, uh, I guess decipher new information faster and become better at multitasking. Well, okay, that's cool. I guess, uh, maybe, maybe that's where I've gotten some of my ability to do some multitasking, but my attention span has not improved for anything outside of, you know, a few topics that I'm, that I'm really interested in. <laughs> Yeah, I'm also, I'm sat here pondering, um, I'm playing Mass Effect Andromeda, finally, finally gotten into it. Um, I can't focus on it. I want to play through it. I'm determined to get through the damn game, but I can't keep focus on it because it's not that interesting a game. Uh, I don't know. I have that problem sometimes when games are interesting. It's just because for whatever reason, I'm just having trouble getting into it. Maybe you're just not getting into it that much. No, it's, um, I think, too many side quests and too many bugs. And I'm not just talking about the visual glitches, the, the game-breaking bugs. In it. So I can play it for two hours, and that's it. And in those two hours, by the last half hour, I'm standing up, I'm sitting down, I'm walking around while playing. Surprise, I'm playing on a PlayStation, so yeah, I can walk around my living room while playing. It's It's an interesting enough story. It's just not letting me focus because it's all over the map, the game itself. I'm trying to think if there's ever been a time I like stood up and walked around while playing a game. I mean, aside from some of the stuff where you have controllers where you need to stand up and swing the controllers around, but you know, typical video game position where you're sitting down with the controller. I don't think I've ever gotten up for anything. <laughs> well, I'm getting older. I need to move every half an hour, right? Uh, if I don't stand up every once in a while, then my uh, joints lug up, and you know they'll have to call an ambulance. Well, that would not be fun. Okay, I'm not that far gone. But yeah, it's it's getting to the point where standing up every so often is just a thing you do while playing video games, which you keyboard joggies can't do. I don't know if it's not a matter of can't. I would say probably just don't feel the need. Oh. <laughs> well, there was one other little thing that's been up quite a bit recently. Um, G2A. As to not be mistaken for GTA, G2A, key reseller, online. Where you <laughs> what, can, what? There might be some similarities there, right? <laughs> there might be. They are selling keys. So if you have surplus game keys, you can sell them on that website, which sounds, you know, when you just think about it, oh, yeah, I bought some games on uh, Humble Bundles. I bought some bundles. I have keys that I never redeemed. Sell them on online. Why not? It sounds fair enough, no? I mean, you would think so. Yeah, um, again, yet again, a game developer has come out and said, please don't buy our game on G2A, please don't buy keys there. Just go and pirate the game. Just don't buy them. And what's coming out is a lot of um, game developers do not sell their games on G2A. They are not okay with them being sold there. They do not make money of keys sold there. And they don't want G2A to make money off of what in many cases actually turns out to be fraudulent keys. Well, now, you say that developers, that, you know, some of the developers are not selling their keys there, but isn't it all developers? I mean, it's a key reselling site, so I would have thought there wouldn't be any developers selling their stuff on there, or are there developers that are selling things on G2A? Well, a couple of years ago, they launched something they called G2A Direct, where game developers could actually sign up to sell keys directly on G2A. It's not going very well because nobody really wanted to, but I've seen them at events trying to convince people, game developers, to do this. And, I mean, I would get why. With the fraudulent stuff, there's so much to that. I mean, you know, I've seen reports of, you know, somebody, uh, you know, for instance, uh, does identity theft and, and gets a credit card and then buys a bunch of keys and then turns around and sells them on those keys on G2A by the time the credit card fraud is discovered and the and the uh, you know the bank goes back to the developer for the money you know those keys have been sold on G2A and the the person committing the credit card fraud has already got their money and so it ends up costing the developers money which that's i don't know <laughs> i was talking to a buddy of mine about this over the weekend because this had been such a big deal 
and you know we were trying to theorize different things that might assist with this of course i don't know that g2a would be even willing to consider it but i think one of the things we came up with was uh basically putting funds on hold like until you can get some kind of verified account on g2a for selling things that if you did sell anything that it would be put on like a two week or one month hold before they would release the funds to you and that way if there is any kind of credit card fraud or anything like that any fraudulent stuff going on that would hopefully get caught in that say 30 day time period prior to them releasing the funds and then the funds could go back to you know whoever was defrauded from the sale yeah i, I think that assumes too much on what's actually going on because they are two separate processes one somebody gets a uh, gets hold of credit card you can buy these online credit card details are actually sold on websites you go and you buy the game, eventually it gets um, discovered, or you just do a chargeback on a credit card. And the seller has already given the key to the person doing the fraud. It's all That transaction has already fully completed before G2A gets involved. Go over there and sell it. The only time G2A then can see that it's a fraudulent key is, and not even G2A, but the person buying the key, can see that it's fraudulent is if the seller goes in and steam or whichever system and deactivates the keys as this key was acquired fraudulently and there's a weird thing at least on steam it seems that the moment it's verified the moment steam has said yeah this is a valid key the person who ended up buying it at the end of the chain has redeemed it then it's no longer a thing then they can't take that key back or at least not for the small ones one of the other ways they get around that is they do it as uh, gifts. So you buy a key, you have to befriend the person selling it, and they gift it to you, and then do a chargeback on that one. Those can also not be rolled back. So there isn't really much for G2A to do at the moment we're talking fraudulent, except if too many come back and say, oh, that sale was fraudulent, that sale was fraudulent, then they can kill the uh, account for this reseller. But people just create new accounts anyway. So there's... There's a lot of things that G2A cannot do. That doesn't excuse what they're doing. It doesn't excuse people selling there. The, the whole thing should not exist, really. Well, you say the whole thing shouldn't exist, but I think the idea of this sprung up from, like, uh, physical media. So, you know, it used to be you would go buy a physical copy of a game, and when you were done with it, you could trade it in, or you could give it to a buddy, or you could sell it, you know, on Craigslist, or, you know, something like that, where you're you could recoup some of the cost that you spent on the game. So I, I like the idea of there being a way to resell a digital key that I'm no longer going to use. I mean, I don't need hundreds of games in my, say, Steam inventory that I'll never play again. Once I'm, once I'm done with the game, it would be really nice if I could deactivate the key in my Steam inventory and then sell it. But that's, you know, that's not even available uh, at this point in time. Well, on that one, I would be okay if Steam had a way of saying, yeah, I'm deactivating my key, um, giving it back to Steam, and if somebody buys that key, then I get a percentage, Steam get a percentage, and the game developer get a percentage. Like I, I could, would like that. I could be perfectly okay with that. Um, one of the fun parts, do you remember, what was it, last year, two years, three years ago? Ooh. At one point, Ubisoft had the uh, misfortune that a lot of keys had been acquired fraudulently and sold off, and Ubisoft went out and basically wanted to deactivate the keys and the people getting hurt complained and Ubisoft eventually relented and said okay yeah well you can keep the game but they were games they had gotten fraudulently remember that story this sounds vaguely familiar but uh you know you know me and my memory so I've slept a few times since then <laughs> yeah so that was one of those weird things where the public actually went out and said nope we bought the game game keys we should be allowed to have them even if they were acquired fraudulently. And I have a really big time with that. No. If you buy them on questionable websites and it turned out to be fraudulent, you kind of stepped in it. It's your own fault. Don't buy your keys on third-party websites that you don't really know are uh, approved by the game developer. If there's nothing on the game developer site saying you can buy it there, don't buy it there. Buy it somewhere where you know that you're getting a legit key. Well, I, I do definitely understand that, but then also you're going to have people uh, who maybe don't follow gaming news who don't know. 
and G2A has been doing things like, you know, paying for ad space and their ads are showing up higher when you do like a Google shopping search than the actual developers ad who made the game. So you may see that and you may think, oh, okay, you know, I can buy my game there. You know, I, I've bought and, uh, bought stuff from uh, Green Man Gaming, which as far as I know is, is an, you know, up and up uh, website for, you know, purchasing your storefront for purchasing games. I've never had any problems with anything I've purchased from them. I've never seen any bad stuff about them in the news. But um, until a buddy of mine had told me about Green Man Gaming because of some sale that was going on, I hadn't heard of them before. So it could just be, you know, you could have a bunch of people buying stuff just because they happened to see the ad and it was a good deal. Oh, definitely. Um, never underestimate that the common person just do not have access to this and do not see this. We know of this because it gets picked up in gaming news. We know of this because, gee, we're following, uh, in this case, it's Mike Rose who brought it up this time around. Previous, there were other game developers who brought it up that we also happen to follow on the Tweety and the Faceache. But most gamers don't, and Mumsies and Popsies definitely don't. So I can totally see why people think that G2A is legit. Bam, hates that word. They, uh, they sponsor streamers for all. So people go on, see their favorite streamers, know there's an ad for a G2A. They're probably legit. But at the end of the day, you're still taking a risk. If you know the game is distributed by Steam, if you're buying it online, you're getting a Steam key, perhaps you should have bought it on Steam. Yeah, there's something to be said for that. But then, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like you, like we talked about, when you see somebody you know, who, who doesn't know any better but is just looking at the price... And the game is listed, say, you know, on sale on Steam for thirty bucks, but on a website like G2A for say twenty bucks, that doesn't necessarily ring any immediate alarm bells because it's not that much drastic of a difference. But uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if I don't know if I think that means they should be able to keep the game that they bought fraudulently because ultimately, I, no matter what, no matter which way you look at it, somebody's losing out on this and somebody's gaining something that they you know have no right to gain. Oh yeah, and if you're buying stolen goods, you kind of need to accept that, again in my opinion, that you lose the goods. That's <laughs> that's the law in pretty much every at least Western country. Stolen goods, well, they can be taken back to the owner. Um, could the owners then go out, you know, the game developers say, oh, you bought a key over in G2A and it turned out to be fraudulent. Here's a discount on our game if you buy it correctly. Now in the future, you know to do that. That would be nice but they're not under any obligation. And if you buy on G2A and it turns out to be a fraudulent key, go to your credit card process and say, that turned out to be fraudulent, it turned out to be stolen. Um, and the company here, <laughs> G2A, seems to have a headache around that. You know, They seem to have a tendency to do this. Demand a chargeback. Well, you know, that's something I, I don't know if I've seen, if other folks have covered that, but what happens when the... Uh the end user who purchased the key finds out that the key doesn't work, are they able to then go back to G2A and ask for a refund, or is is G2A being a pain about that and forcing them to do a chargeback? Well, officially, you can go back to G2A and they will track it. Uh, to what extent they do, I don't know. To what extent they actually ban resellers, I don't know. But they say they will say they do. I would go for the credit card chargeback. I know it's a pain in the ass if you do it with... Um, if you do that on PlayStation, for example, Sony closes your account. If you've had actual issues with Sony, you bought a game that doesn't work, you do a chargeback by credit card, Sony just closes your account. Um, thankfully, you're not going to be hit that hard with G2A, but if you buy, I don't know, eBay? I'm pretty sure you can find game keys sold on eBay. It will be interesting to see um, if, if they won't go completely berserk on you. Overreact. Well, you know, and that's the, the funny thing here is that that's their, I guess ultimate defense is uh, you know when it comes to uh, how this has all been going down they're like oh well if we didn't do it somebody else would it's like so that in your eyes seems to make it okay like if you didn't do it then people would just sell them on ebay and but you're okay i guess taking that cash from that fraudulent sale or potential fraudulent sale yeah that was terrible g2a came out and said oh we're, we're doing this because if we didn't somebody else would yeah that doesn't make it right it's still a wrong thing that you're ultimately doing because you don't have a way of controlling that it isn't fraudulent, it isn't stolen, it isn't uh, scammed by a press key requested, all those things. If they don't have a way of doing that, then they shouldn't be doing it. 
and oh yeah, somebody else would be doing it if we didn't. It just doesn't work. But yeah, I don't know. I, I still would like to see some of these storefronts like Steam and, and others allow you to deactivate a key in your own library and then resell it that way. I don't know that that would necessarily have much of an effect on G2A's business because I think a lot of the times it's the stuff that's being sold there are stuff people weren't going to use anyway. But, you know, at least if you have a, a way to sell things on the storefront legitimately, then maybe less people would use G2A. I don't know. Yeah, again, th there is a valid, there's a legal thing here where you say, well, you can buy humble bundles and end up with too many keys of a game. That's a thing. We all have, I think, games, at least a couple of them, where we have an extra key simply because we owned the game. There was a humble bundle and we bought it, and whoopsie, there was another key for the same game. Sure, find a way to get rid of that. I give them away. It's, it's, I have no money, I have no income, but I don't want to resell them. <laughs> have them instead. But I can appreciate others would like to resell them, and there is something legit there. Steam should support that, somehow. Well, and there's also times where you may not have the key, but you buy a bundle and there's, you know, one or two items in there you're not going to use anyway. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And they're just so there is there's a legitimate business case there, but there's just too many illegitimate, as I said, people who scam press keys, people who steal credit cards or do chargebacks. Just a small note, if you think a chargeback doesn't hurt anybody. Um, Humble Bundle was at one point in one day charged 34,000, I think it was. 34,000 in one day on chargebacks. That's not money that they've been paid, they had to pay back. No, that's the processing fee from the credit card uh, issuers or the payment processors, to use the correct term. Every single chargeback comes with a $30 fee. And there were enough that it resulted in $3,400 or $34,000 they had to pay. And in the case of Humble Bundle, that's money that would have gone to charity. That now didn't, because people used Humble Bundle to scam. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, and that, as I said, that was one day. A lot of these small uh, game developers, when they try to sell them on their own website, they end up with um, tens and hundreds of these every single day, each of them costing $30. So it's not it's not something that happens um, without an effect. It's not something that is free to do. You're not not hurting somebody. No, you are hurting the game developers when doing this. You're stealing keys and you're costing them money. So instead of you paying them, say, $30 for their game, they end up paying $30 for you stealing the game. And as I understand it, once they're made aware of the fraudulent key transaction too, I think that they end up having to spend time that could have been used in development, either bug fixing, updates, DLCs, whatever, uh, instead having to do, you know, investigate and track down some of these fraudulent keys. For the very small ones, yeah, that's, you know, <laughs> when you have two, three, four people working, somebody has to do all this work, handling the chargebacks, handling the tracking of keys, etc. Slightly larger, they will have people doing it, but they're still the community people, the press relations marketing people who are doing it. And now they have to still pay somebody to do all that work. So it is a loss of work. It's just, it's costing too much for an industry that has too, <laughs> arguably too many players, but have a lot of companies who are really small and just barely scraping by. If they sell 10,000 copies and all their uh, profit goes to deal with this, no thank you. Also, you said that um, it's an idea for getting keys cheaper. I just looked. Anthem for PS4 on G2A, $55. <laughs> that sounds like somebody's a little bit hopeful. <laughs> Just a tiny bit. Uh, well, I was I was under the impression that that's why people did purchase things there was because they could get them cheaper. But, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know. This was an um, exception. Yeah, it must be <laughs> $55. Can't you get that game for free in some of the storefronts? <laughs> Possibly, or, you know, for free with a um, USB key. No, wait, that was Fallout. Fallout came free with a something gigabyte USB key. I thought Anthem, if you bought a controller or something, you got it free, or maybe that was also Fallout. Maybe I'm confusing the two. No, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was an Anthem deal somewhere. Anyways, that was sort of it. A little bit about Warframe, because there's a lot of updates. Go check out the videos for Warframe. We'll link them down below. The whole Railjack, which is now Empyrean... 
Looks like a lot of fun. Interesting mechanics. Let's see how it works out. Um, Drag has his little thing from Swiss. If you have a link track, put it down below as well. And finally, uh, G2A. Don't buy games there. Go pirate them instead. We're not saying you should go pirate them. Other people are saying we're, you should go pirate them. We're just saying they're saying it. Please do not pirate games in general. Um, our lawyer says that we can't say that. <laughs> no, go go purchase them and support, especially when it comes to indie developers. You know, I, I get the argument where some people want to try and stick it to the big companies who are trying to screw everybody over on loot boxes and microtransactions, but you don't get that same kind of argument when it comes to indie devs. Support the indie devs. They're making a lot more of the, the fun stuff that we all enjoy anyway. You also don't try to screw over the big ones because they just close studios and you'll have a lot of people unemployed. So there you go. Bad all the way around. Yes. People, it's been a day. It's been a weird little episode, partly because we want to put one out, and it's, I said, it's July. We didn't do News Monday, but there should be news in a couple of days when it's Friday. Just wrapping up, probably more Warframe. Beyond that, I was G, and it was nice talking to you. And uh, don't forget to like, subscribe if you're not already subscribing. Yeah, that's it. Click on all the buttons, ding all the bells, all the fun stuff. This is Drac, and I'm out too.